I think there are certain goods you, you can't have them without a concomitant evil, like compassion or courage. An example I've sometimes given is the example of, of someone like Martin Luther King being a great man, right? Because he overcomes this great evil. Surely we'd rather be living in a world where there were no racism and no need for Martin Luther King. It sounds to me that in a lot of cases, when somebody disagree. says... I just disagree. I mean... You, you, so you, you think it's better to actualize a world in which that is racism? I think it's more racism? valuable. I think a world that has that and has the accompanying evils is more valuable. I've seen videos of like animals being like ripped apart like on Reddit and stuff. Sometimes you'll look at the animal and they look peaceful. Like they're being ripped apart and they're just like sitting there like this. Just like getting their <laughs> leg like ripped off. The theist may say, well maybe God just isn't all powerful. That may be the case, but such a ghost of a God uh, is hardly different from atheism or worth believing in. This episode of the Cosmic Skeptic Podcast is brought to you by you. To support the podcast, please visit patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. A Catholic, a Protestant, an atheist and an agnostic all walk into a house in the Bible Belt. This sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it is in fact the beginning of today's episode of the Cosmic Skeptic Podcast, because in a rather ambitious attempt to uh, expand the podcast and make it reach new heights, I've invited three other guests onto the podcast with me today. I am joined by Cameron Bertuzzi, our resident Protestant. I'm joined by Joe Schmidt, our agnostic. Trent Horn, are Catholic, hi, hi. and I am, as always, Alex O'Connor, your atheist. And we decided it would be fun, since we're all here together in Houston, in order to do an event, the Capturing Christianity Exchange, which at this point will be in the past, so the videos of, of the interactions that we're all going to be having in our public event, I'll put the links down in the description. We thought while we're here it would be cool to sit down as a four and talk about something which is important to all of us from our different perspectives. It, it comes up regardless of of, of how you're talking about the subject of religion, uh, which is the problem of evil. And what better company to talk about the problem of evil with than people who come at it from completely different approaches. So, I don't really know how we should best begin this, but I guess uh, for, for myself, the problem of evil is, is easily the greatest argument against the existence of a god. Would, would we all agree that that is the case? You mean for people in general, or for us? For, for in, in, in your view, I mean, like, like what, in terms of arguments that would seek to establish kind of strong A atheism well, that God I, doesn't exist. I would, yeah, I would say historically the problem of evil or unjustifiable suffering is a strong one. I, I mean, Aquinas basically dealing with the arguments for God really dealt with two arguments against God. One's the problem of evil and one is the problem of essentially scientific explanation apart from God. So I would say historically, yes. Uh, though, I mean, it's not, I have other concerns more so than the, the problem of evil. For me personally, it was never as big a hurdle to get over as maybe for other people. Mm. What do you guys, do you think it's a... Uh... I think it's the, like, the biggest challenge to uh, perfect being theism is the way that I would put it. So I, Joe and I were talking about this in our interview is that like how... What is the really what is the real breadth of the problem of evil? What do, uh, like of all the different types of theisms that might be out there, which one does it really target? And I think that it targets primarily perfect being theism, where you've got these triomnis, the the omnibenevolent God, the omni uh, omnipotent God, and does it really like so? There's a there's a philosopher who I interviewed recently on my channel. His name is uh, Philip Goff. Is he a philosopher? I think he's a philosopher. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's got this concept of God that he's sort of toying around with at the at the moment, where he says that God is all good, but he's not all powerful. And what he argues is that the problem of evil doesn't really even like say anything about that type of God, if that God exists. Yeah, that's a view. There was a, a rabbi who, I forget his name right off the top of my head, but his 14-year-old son, I think, died of a degenerative disease. And that was essentially the conclusion. So that's, that view's been around for a while. That, the conclusion he came to how do I understand this horrible death of my son and being a rabbi? Yeah. He said, well, God loves us and he wants to help us, but he just can't. Yeah. I love, there is a book, uh, by an old book by this guy, B.C. Johnson, called The Atheist Debater's Handbook. It's like this little book I found at the library once. And it was funny, he was dealing with the problem of evil. He said, the theist may say, well, maybe God just isn't all powerful. And he said in the book, 
That may be the case, but such a ghost of a god uh, is hardly different from atheism or worth believing in. So I thought that was an interesting reply from, from him. That like I think for a lot of atheists I don't know it's it's like perfect being theism or bust. Yeah. I don't know. Because the yeah. the, the the idea that maybe God is all loving but not all powerful it, it seems to me a different to that distinction to most theodicies uh, that is in their practical effect. If you have a, a theodicy, which for anyone listening who doesn't know is is an attempt to um, what's the word reconcile the existence of a loving God with the existence of evil in the world. Or at least suffering in the world. Um, well, not just a loving God, an omnipotent. Well, unless you're trying to make yeah, a, a yeah, a god, a, a god, and any that any is attempt. both all loving and all. Well, it, it does depend. Traditionally speaking, to reconcile God and evil would be a defense to give a reason to explain why God allows evil mm. and the goods He's achieving would be theodicy. That, yeah, that that's right. That's that's a helpful distinction. Um, I think in terms of trying to justify, let's say, the existence of a god in the face of evil and suffering, people have given lots of famous examples. They talk about the fact that God wants us to have free will. He talks about the fact that God allows evil and suffering to bring about higher order goods. But to me, this translates to saying something like, well, God has this end which he desires to bring about and potentially needs to bring about if he's a maximally great being, if, if, he's, if he's by nature good, he might need to bring about the best outcomes or, or, or at least have a duty to bring about particular outcomes. I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of that, but you can keep going. But I'm, I frown my nose. <laughs> yeah, I, I, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, frown at that too, and I, I'm not sure I can even agree with it myself just because I'm not sure what it would mean to bring about like the maximal amount of good. Or, or the, the idea that God has to do that. Yes. For, like, like, for example, like imagine God made a world, a universe like ours, but it only possessed inorganic matter. And it actually had a lot of beauty. Like it had waterfalls and rocky crags and meteors and volcanoes and all kinds of cool stuff. Mm. Uh, would it be? I mean, would it be bad for God to make that kind of world? I, I don't. It would have no suffering in it whatsoever. So I don't. So I doubt you would think that God was bad for making a world just inorganic matter. Mm. But I think a lot of us would think you could make that better with people and conscious beings. But I don't know if God is like obliged to make it better. Mm. So I don't know. Yeah, sure. Um, whether, whether he needs to or not, the... Mm. the but you'd expect, it's something to expect from him, the, not the, to drop the ball. The justifications yeah. are kind of a, a, a given, that take, take a form of saying that God has some other purpose which he seeks to fulfill, such, such as free will. And, and the idea is that there's some kind of metaphysical or logical impossibility with God bringing about, say, a world of free creatures and there being no suffering or something like this. And so, in a sense, uh, something like a free will defense that says, well, th there's just no way to bring about free will without suffering is like a way of saying, well, God is all loving, but because he's got this thing, free will, that he wants to bring about, he's just incapable of preventing this kind of suffering because if he were, it, we wouldn't have free will. So a kind of response that, that makes sense of a God that allows suffering that says, well, maybe God's just not all powerful. It seems to me the same kind of thought as many other kinds of theodicies because, because they're, they're essentially saying, well, kind of God, it's not like God's happy about this suffering taking place, but he, he just doesn't have the power to take it away either because uh, there's, there's some kind of thing that he needs to bring about that requires suffering or just because there's something he wants to bring about that still makes it impossible for him to not have suffering. It seems like a similar kind of approach. I guess it depends on what you mean by all powerful. I mean, that's, if, the, that's the key. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's metaphysically impossible, like if there's no way that reality could be such that God could bring about these goods without allowing certain sorts of evils to transpire, then it's no mark against God's omnipotence to be bound in this way. After all, it's impossible for God to have done otherwise than he couldn't have had the power to do that because it's an impossible power, essentially. Yeah. So I don't really see that as compromising God's omnipotence. It just depends on how you cash it out. Yeah, well, well ne neither do I. But I mean, in terms of how people might make sense of this, when somebody says something like, well, I, I've, I've gone through a horrible experience, and so I can, the only way I can make sense of this is to think that maybe God just isn't all powerful. They could be equally captivated by a view that says, you're, you're so nearly right. You're, you're right that the suffering exists because God somehow has to allow it, but it's not because he's not omnipotent. It's just because uh, even there are things that an omnipotent being can't well, well, do. I think it doesn't Joe mean is, he's not an omnipotent Joe's God. Joe's kind of right? on the path. It's like God is saying, 
well, God has allowed this suffering, and it could be the case that there is a particular good that would not be accessible without it. So, I mean, if you think about, like, omnipotence is like power is the ability to, to do something. Um, there are just some things no amount of power could do because they're impossible for whatever whatever reasons. I think what you're getting in the free will issue, there's kind of two different ways to go about it. Uh, well, although I don't, I don't want to derail from the, the point that you were making. I'll put it out there and you can tell me if I'm derailing. Uh, one approach is kind of like planting his view. It could be the case God can't make a world where all free creatures choose good because we have these counterfactuals of freedom. Like you make Cameron, you put Cameron in a world, whatever. Don't, he's gonna, don't use me in this example. <laughs> by the way, Cameron will always choose the wrong in some possible world. I'm not sure I'm really inclined to that. I think God can make a world where only free creatures choose things, uh, but it would also lack certain goods. And so it may be the case God has reasons for allowing certain good. Like, I, I, I would agree. I think there are certain goods you, you can't have them without a concomitant evil, like compassion or courage. Yeah. Mm. You might have things that look like them, but aren't them. Of course, we, we spoke before. I mean, we had a debate on mm. uh, Matt Frad's channel a while ago, and we spoke a little bit about this. I, I can't remember if we spoke specifically about, about this topic, but mm. the idea of there being these goods like bravery, that can't come about unless they're parasitic on some suffering or evil. Right. To me, something like bravery is only good insofar as it overcomes some, some form of suffering or evil. Like, it, it seems to me if you could have a world without the suffering and without the bravery, without the fear and without the bravery, this would be more desirable because, sure, you wouldn't have bravery, but if you don't need bravery, it doesn't, it doesn't just seem to me to be like a good thing intrinsically. It seems only good relative to the existence of some form of fear and suffering. Without the fear and suffering, it, it, would, it wouldn't be intrinsically good. In fact, if you removed the fear and suffering and somebody was still acting in the way that a brave person would act, you, you'd say they were just being like immodest. You'd think it was a bad thing. Well, right, See, here, I, I, let yeah. me jump in real quick. Sure. I, I don't know that we can actually advance the conversation when you make that kind of move. Because to me, I think the problem of evil... I don't want to say that it collapses into axiology, but that's very central to the problem of evil is this notion of like, what is most valuable? Because God is going to instantiate the world that is most valuable. And what you're saying is that a world that doesn't have these goods, but also doesn't have the suffering is more valuable than a world that does have those goods with the, with the evils that sort of come along with it. So, and like, how do you go, like, how do you advance when you kind of put your foot on the, What's the right term? Put your foot down and you're like, I just don't think that that's as valuable. Like I think what's most valuable is a world that doesn't have that. And then what can we say? We can say, well, we think that a world that has those, that has those higher order goods and the accompanying evils, like we think that's more valuable. And it's like, how do you actually progress there? That's that's kind of, I think we may actually run into like a stalemate. Because I think that there, there are different intuitions on different goods that are supposedly served by suffering. For example, mm -hmm. the example of bravery, I, I think, is maybe a bit of a poor one because it seems intuitively to me that uh, we'd rather have no need for bravery and, and no bravery in, in the same way that... See, but that's just... You, but, like, but, I, don't I don't think that. But, I think that courage is... or, like, bravery and courage is com very compare it, valuable. Compare it, for example, though, to, to something like the free will defense, which I think is it's a bit easier to argue that something like free will is just of a, of a different category of, of, of you could thing. Pick, you could pick something else. You could pick compassion, for example. Or forgiveness. Like, or let, Yeah, like let's say somebody is, like let's say someone experiences compassion for the suffering of a fictional character. And even that I don't think is, like I agree with you, like courage where there's no real danger is very like Don Quixote, very like, okay. But like, you know, but, but like, <laughs> but to watch a film and to ha to feel an emotional compassion towards the sufferings of a person that doesn't exist, you know, they're fictional. I I don't think that that's a, a, a bad. I think that I well, think the exist I think thing. the existence of the compassion itself it is a good thing. Yeah, uh, well, it may be, um, and maybe that for that reason it's a it's a better example. Yeah. I think that, that that's, to answer your point, Cameron, I think that this isn't kind of equally obviously true with all of these higher order goods. I just think that with something like bravery, it seems to me fairly intuitive. I mean, you said you prefer to live in a world 
where there is fear and suffering so that we can have the good of bravery. An example I've sometimes given is the example of, of someone like Martin Luther King being a great man, right, because he overcomes this great evil. Surely we'd rather be living in a world where there were no racism and no need for Martin Luther King. It sounds to me that in a lot of cases when somebody disagree. says... I just disagree. I mean... You, you, so you think it's better to actualize a world in which there is racism? I think it's more racism? valuable. I think a world that has that and has the accompanying evils is more valuable. I mean, and that's... That's why I say that I think we may be at a stalemate. Like if you, when you make that move, we're just disagreeing about like our, our baseline axiological well, assumptions that we bring to the table. We're, we're all bringing our own axiological assumptions. And if that's the one that you bring and that's the one that I bring, it's like how do we, how do we advance from there? I, I haven't seen, an, like I don't, I don't really see a, a way out. I'm curious what your thoughts are on yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to convey yeah, here. Well, I mean, at bottom, I mean, it might just be a clash of intuitions. I mean, I tend to think that lots of philosophy is based, but lots of actually reasoning in general, including scientific reasoning, bottoms out in kind of seemings, things yeah. like that, like things yeah. seem to you to be the case, or things appear to you to be the case. And sometimes those can come in conflict when you're in these sorts of dialectical contexts. And it's really difficult to know how to progress from there when two people kind of disagree well, with respect to their could, basic seeming. Could we go back a little bit, Alex, to your? The formulation of the problem of evil you find most pressing, is it to you that it is a logical contradiction between God's existence and the world, or that it just makes God's existence highly improbable? I think it's more the latter. Um, improbable. I'm, I'm a little mm -hmm. suspicious of the distinction here. When people try to distinguish between the logical and, and evidential problem of evil, they'll say, if you have a logical problem of evil that says something like, you know, uh, if there is a God, there would be no suffering. There is suffering, therefore there is no God. People say this argument is dead in the water because as long as it's logically possible that God has some reason, like morally sufficient reason to bring about evil, the argument fails. In other words, if, if one of the premises is not, it is, it's logically possible for one of the premises to be, to be false, then it's not really a logical argument you're putting forward, but an evidential one. But imagine if someone put forward the Kalam cosmological argument and said this is a logical argument, a valid syllogism. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And I said, oh, but that's not really a logical argument because as long as it's logically possible that the universe uh, didn't have a beginning, as long as it's logically possible that something can begin without a cause, then you know, the argument's dead in the water. So you shouldn't really be advocating a logical Kalam, but rather an evidential Kalam. But that just seems like a weird distinction to make. And I feel like people do it unfairly with the problem uh, of evil, but not with any other deductive argument that exists. I don't know if it goes exactly like that, because it seems to me, like I've encountered, when I've heard your discussions about the problem of evil, it sounds like you've said things like, I understand how people could see where free will would be a reason God would tolerate evil among humans or something like that. But, but then why do animals suffer in such and such way? Yes. And that, and that seems to insinuate that you could have some evils, that they're, they're not lo they're not, there's not a logical contradiction there as opposed to, you know, God... Uh, you know, well, there's a lot of different logical arguments uh, trying to say that God does, doesn't exist. They'd be incompatible properties, things like that. But it seems like you're saying it's just like, well, yeah, I could see a world where there's evil at this threshold, but not at this threshold. And that's more the, the evidential, it seems like to me. I'm not sure, because you could, just, you could just pull out a logical version. You could say, for instance, that the existence of suffering does not... There's no kind of logical syllogism I would use just from the existence of suffering alone to rule out God's well, existence. But maybe I could formulate, if, if I said, well, God would tolerate human evil for free will, but not animal suffering, mm -hmm. then I could just formulate a logical problem of evil that specifically uh, focuses on animal suffering. Okay. It would still be a, a valid argument. It would still be a formal uh, logical syllogism. The fact that it's kind of more specified or, or allows mm -hmm. for the... Uh, existence of other forms of unrelated suffering, it, it seems irrelevant to me as to well, whether Let's say this. Trent, so Trent Doherty, he's got a... His view is basically he doesn't like the distinction either. Mm. And he's like one of the most premier philosophers that's working on uh, the problem of evil. He's a Catholic. So... Uh, but it's, I'll let you explain, but is, is he... The, he so is he, he the, thinks... Is, go ahead. So he thinks that... So basically there's there's two premises to is the argument. Of you? He, he's, yes, he, does yes, have yes. That, he does have that view, but it's that's just, not okay, what I'm talking okay, about now. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll no, what, I'm, what I'm talking about now is that the logical version and the evidential version 
he thinks both are basically very similar. So the first one, or, mm. or the the first premise is basically a theological claim about what would exist if God exists, and then the second one is the evidential claim about whether or not there's this type of suffering in the world. So like evil exists or animal suffering exists. And in the logical version, the evidential version, it, it involves both the theological claim and then the evidential claim. So he thinks that the distinction collapses too. It's just like whatever you, whatever specific theological claim you happen to be focusing on at this time yes. is the, the, so I, and I'm kind of like, I kind of agree with that. I, I kind of think that the distinction between the logical and the evidential version. You know what it seems to me, if I, if I can be, Frank is it seems Please. to me that somebody will kind of present a logical problem of evil and in, in the context of a, of a discussion or a debate where somebody is trying to argue against an atheist, they try to kind of, they, they say like, well, are you making a logical version or an evidential version? And they kind of get them on the back foot thinking, well, oh, I guess it's logically, well, yes, yeah, logically possible that God could have morally sufficient reason. And they're like, well, then you're not making as strong a claim as you thought you were. It, it seems like kind of a useful rhetorical tool for the for the theist, but if you actually like pay close attention to the to the conversation that's taking place, as you say, Cameron, I think the distinction is actually it just collapse. just it, it collapses. It's not really a it's not a helpful one. It's only helpful instrumentally to winning a, a well, now, conversation. You know. Now I want to like play moderator and be like, Trent, is that what you were trying to do? No. Well, I don't think that's yeah. what you were trying yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think yeah. that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> no, but I, I feel I'm, like that's how I'm trying the to wrap my head around. I do emerged. believe. I do believe there's there is this distinction between one claim that any amount of evil whatsoever would show God does not exist versus particular kinds of quantity or quality of evil would make it unlikely. I do think there is a, a legitimate. Yeah, there's a difference. difference between those, but both yeah. of those could be called logical. No, then, arguments, I mean that's right? semantics, and that's fine. Well, it's not, it's not it's semantics. More, it's the difference between a logical argument and an, like to say something's not a logical ar argument is kind of an evidential problem. It's not, it's not logical because it's logically possible that one of the premises is false. It seeks to undermine the logical validity of the argument. Where I would, the reason I ask for the distinction is because I believe that if the problem is a certain quality or quantity of evil, then that is subject to a criticism that can't be leveled against an argument that says, any amount of evil would disprove God. Uh, because the criticism would be this, that if an atheist says, yes, I could see how this amount of evil could be justifiable, but not this amount, one wonders why can't the defenses for this amount be applied to the other amount? Whereas if you have someone who says, hey, it's all or none, that reply won't really work. Well, it might kind of be like, if, if the government came along and just, just flooded everybody's houses by just like pouring water into their front gardens and just absolutely flooding and destroying their property. Mm. And you said that like, this is ridiculous. Obviously the government is, is trying somehow to, to cause riots or something. And somebody said, well now hold on. Like, I mean, if the government were to install a sprinkler system that like watered your garden, you think this was fine, right? And it's like, yes. And you say, well look, so, so now your argument isn't so much that it's like, it's some, some real like, absolute incompatibility between a good government and flooding your house because you're saying you know you're allowing the government to to put a little bit of water onto your garden but if it's it's this much then that's that's too but like it just seems like a, a weird line to take do you see what i'm see what i'm saying no i mean there's robust versions of the evidential problem uh that i agree with you that if somebody basically says the logical problem of evil doesn't work and then they kind of ignore the other arguments for an evidential problem, then that's, then that's problematic. But um, then it'll, it'll come back down to, though, in different intuitions, when certain things are allowable, what can we foresee? And I think it's a bit more than that when we, because yeah, I would love to get to drill down a little bit, especially your concerns seem to be, because and you seem to have reaffirmed this previously. I don't want to talk too much. I want to hear what Joe says too, and Cam that I would think that if the concern is primarily about non-human suffering, I wonder if there is a way to apply the justifications for, for, for human suffering in, the, in these different ways. That's, I guess that's what I would look at to be, yeah. to be most promising. But if you think human suffering is also pointless, then we're kind of back at square one. I think that would, that would, be, that would be good to discuss. I, I think one, one thing to say is that I think we would all agree, I'm not sure, but that an, an argument, a problem of evil argument that says something like 
any amount of evil and suffering whatsoever is logically incompatible with God is is just a, is is a bad argument. It's it's not going to work. It's not super popular, but there's I mean there's people who there, there are arguments. people who say that, but I think everybody here would, would probably think that that's that would that would be a bad argument. I mean, I for myself, I think when I say like a logical problem of evil, I, I think maybe that there's a confusion here because you seem to be defining the logical problem of evil as the view that any amount of evil and suffering is incompatible with God. I think that's pretty traditional. I, I have a, I maybe, maybe I guess it's, it's if, if that's what people are calling it, maybe I, I, should, I should change my terminology here because when I talk about the difference between a logical and an evidential problem, I mean to say that there are kind of versions of an argument that don't say any amount of evil and suffering well, is incompatible, but yeah, I, mean, I get what you're saying. You're basically it's just still saying like a logical some, argument. Some versions of the problem of evil just focus on a particular range of facts or a particular range of kinds of evil, and then you can go on to say of those that that is incompatible with God's existence. So not and that you could probably classify that as a logical argument from evil. But instead of getting bogged down with the terminology, we might just want to lay out a particular version of the argument from evil and then mm. just discuss that. So I figured I could probably start with that. Um, I could offer maybe just a pretty intuitive kind of Bayesian argument from evolutionary animal suffering. So uh, we're not going to get into the fancy Bayes machine goes burr. We're not going to do that. But <laughs> let's just think, I mean, under a perfect being hypothesis, at least by my lights, uh, it just seems really surprising that God would use in his very creative act this, uh, this process which is just rife with suffering and languishing and death and predation and parasitism. You know, nature ran a tooth and claw. Uh, organisms are ripping each other to shreds. And th this is just like built into natural selection. This is built into the very process, just this death and destruction and uh, suffering and so on is built into the very means, the very fabric of creation, it seems, from the, from the get-go, it seems. And that just seems like a really surprising way. We wouldn't predict that. It just a priori from the armchair, would we predict a perfect being to bring about, let's say, humans and other sentient creatures by means of a process which is fraught with this kind of suffering, this almost horrendous evil, and not just any horrendous evil, but hundreds of millions of years of this kind of evil. I mean, I remember, just to make this point, mm -hmm. last, no, it was 2020, there were these fires in Australia, and tens of thousands of koalas were burned alive. Now, that's just Australia, that's koalas. These koalas are suffering, being burned alive. That's just Australia, just a few weeks of forest fires. Think about the whole world now, not just Australia. Don't now just think about a few weeks, think about a few years. Now think about tens of thousands of years. Now tens of millions of years. Now how about hundreds of millions of years? It's just, it's mind-boggling. And so that would, that is, by my lines, it just seems surprising on theism. Whereas on a view where, I guess we should just say natural reality is indifferent to the flourishing and languishing of sentient creatures, that's not as surprising. Nature's red and tooth and claw. There's nothing down there that cares about yeah. our, our, the, the flourishing of sentient creatures. So given that it's surprising on one hypothesis and nowhere near as surprising on another, we would have some reason, we have some evidence for the hypothesis on which it isn't surprising. So that's an argument that we could consider. And I think it's worth, I mean, it's worth talking about human suffering, but this argument works if we're just talking about non-humans. And you say kind of natural selection, it involves so much suffering, it, it, it relies upon it. As you say, it's the very machinery. Survival of the fittest the engine. entails death and destruction and suffering of the unfit. This is, this is how it works. Um, uh, to me, I, I find this a compelling argument. I think it works. I think there are some complications when you talk about human beings because there seems to be something else that, that could be said to be going on there. Certainly, just from a kind of coherent Christian picture that, that, that humans are special, they're, they're ensouled, whatever it may be. But even, even on that account, humans evolved like, what, a few million years ago? I mean, Homo sapiens have been around for a few hundred thousand years, so you've still got million, hundreds of millions of years as Joe says, of the suffering. To me, this, this is probably the strongest version of the problem of evil. I have so many thoughts. Uh -huh. I have so many thoughts. I don't even, I, I, it's so difficult to know even where to begin. Yeah. In like, so one, one thought is that I, th like this formulation of the problem of evil has, has made me want to take Trent Doherty's approach to the problem of evil so serious, excuse me, so seriously. Like, I, I think that we do, we, we may need, like, have to look at other resources in order to explain mm -hmm. the data. So it's not just perfect being theism, it's also like these certain axiological assumptions, like these love manifesting virtues being so strong or being so valuable, but then also maybe combine that with the fact that 
animals will be resurrected in the afterlife or there's some sort of afterlife for animals. I, I don't know. I, I think that... I want them to be able to talk yeah. and sing. Exactly. They, their suffering needs to be redeemed. I mean, I'm really... I mean, yes. if I were a theist, I would definitely opt for uh, probably Trent Doherty's approach. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's plausible. But. Well, wait, <laughs> yeah, 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 I, yeah. I will say that, okay, I should probably, for people who are listening, like we're, what we're doing is called inside baseball. Uh, when you sometimes drop a bunch of like names or things and people are like, "What? wait, what? What are they referring to? Yeah. So the tra- in, at least in the Catholic worldview, there's actually a variety of answers to the problem of animal suffering. The traditional Thomistic answer, there's two ways you can look at it. One is that animals uh, do not suffer intensely or their suffering, allowing their suffering is not morally blameworthy. That's one view in the Thomistic tradition or the Cartesian tradition. Uh, Michael Murray would advocate that view in in his book. So one view is that animal suffering, we're not morally blameworthy for causing it. Uh, Or that it's not a significant moral, it's not a significant evil to be concerned with. The other would be, it is significant, but uh, just as human suffering is significant, but animals could be compensated. It's not the traditional Catholic view, but, but it is allowed within Catholic theology. Uh, and so one version of that would be that animals who have a sense of consciousness over time uh, will experience uh, a happiness, fulfillment uh, endlessly in an afterlife. If an animal has a capacity for conscious suffering over time, it stands to reason they could have a capacity for conscious uh, happiness over time. And so God could still give them endless um, happiness. And some Catholics take that view. Uh, And then others like Trent Doherty add more that God could even add goods to them. So they could be transformed. Like by giving them what my friend Jimmy Aiken calls a cognitive boost. And so they they might talk and, and I'm, I did laugh. I mean, I found it a little silly at first reserving it. And I'm still, I'm a bit warmer to the idea I could see that more with the fate of domestic animals versus necessarily wild animals, um, but uh, so so those are um, those are two mm. different approaches. Uh, and then one I I think is worth considering though. I think when the and I think Joe, you laid it out really well in a you know robust way to to get us with the the heart and the head on it. I worry about some of the assumptions. We have to be careful with some of the assumptions built into the argument a bit. Uh, first, for the vast majority of evolutionary history, I don't think animals were sentient. We have like invertebrates and things like that, but it, it's still millions of years. Yeah, sure. Well, definitely, it's hundreds, hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. That, that, so I was going to—I nearly said billions. It's definitely But not then I, I decided not yeah, to say that because, not, the other because the one the is, life, well, life has been on Earth for yes, millions of years. But, billions, but, but well, the kind of the well, kind me, of suffering. Let me yeah, ask this: suppose in those millions. billions of years, um, it, what if? We, the percentage in an animal's existence, its life is either pleasurable, neutral, or painful. Because certain billions of years, there's going to be billions of years of pain, but there are also be billions of years of pleasure and billions of years of neutral activity like sleeping. So I, we, one must be careful not to prejudice this description, and it's just one horrific gore fest. Uh, I, I think we also have to look at the realistic lives of animals and then ask, well, is their existence themselves good? And I guess a thought ex- I gave you a thought experiment in our debate, and here's a, another one that might be more realistic, actually, than the one I gave you in our debate. Uh, would it be wrong for us to send a probe with amino acids to a planet like Earth to start an evolutionary process there that normally would not have begun? And we start this evolutionary chain that will entail a lot of uh, suffering. Uh, now, one quick rejoinder to that is, well, Trent, like, we can't make, you know, that's how we, we don't know how to make life aside from that. But God could certainly, you know, snap his fingers and not use evolution. So that's the, the problem there. But I don't know if that's a great objection. Uh, because if something is just really bad, even if there's no other way to do it, you should still refrain. It'd be like, let's say I could raise an animal with an artificial womb. But the only technology we have, the animal will just suffer horribly every minute of its existence. And I would say, but this is the only way I can grow animals in artificial wombs. I'd say, well, then you just shouldn't do it at all. But if it wouldn't be bad for us to start an evolutionary history 
maybe it's not so bad if God does it, even if he has other ways that he could do it. I don't know. Before y'all come back on that, uh, there's another analogy of like the Amazonian, uh, what do you call it, ecosystem? I don't know. No, the, the Amazonian ecosystem. If we had the technology of which we do, we could just completely wipe out the Amazon right now and all of the animals that are currently suffering and, and going through horrible predation and everything else that's that's going on in the Amazon right now. So, but but like if, suppose that there was a button that you could just press and you could get rid of it all, would you press the button? Well, that's what Trent asked oh, yeah, that was in, uh, in, oh, okay. in, in our debate because I was talking about uh, why why God would allow so much suffering and, and we have to be careful here to notice that, that Joe made an argument from natural selection, right? Not Not so much just animal suffering, but specifically that the process of natural selection, the machinery by which God brings about creation, involves and necessitates uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. So when you ask, you know, would I press a button and kill every animal or would I not? Like, yeah, I, I actually don't really know, mm -hmm. but this isn't the situation that God is in. God has a button that he can press that takes all of the animals living in the Amazon and ha makes their life have 50% less suffering, 80% less suffering and doesn't press it without having to kill them. That's the situation that God is in, so it's, it's not an analogous situation. And we're embedded in the rules of a, of a chess game that's already been laid down, as it were, and we're kind of having to operate within those rules, but we're not the very author of the chess game itself and the rules by which it operates. Yes. If we were, I mean... But I, I, I worry about the feasibility, though, because I see the objection, but even when you articulate, well, why wouldn't God decrease suffering by 50 or 80%? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Like you could get rid of half of all animals. That would decrease the suffering by 50%. You could dull their senses by 50 or 80%. But then could they function? Because I see your, your concern, Joe, like, well, God's making the rules of the game. But it could be the case that creating animal life has these necessary elements in it, provided God does not excessively interfere with um, the system itself. So for example, I mean, suppose it was an evolution. Suppose God created all animals in their final forms, like they are today, and they existed for billions of years and never underwent evolutionary change. It seems like the problem would still remain. You'd have predation, you'd have disease. You would still have all those bad things. There's just no evolutionary mechanism. It's just kind of always been. It seems like there's something more direct about animal life that is the problem here. I guess it de it depends what specifically we're thinking about. I mean, there are different things to disentangle here. Are we focusing on, is it the fact that God used this almost like as a means by which to bring about creatures? And, you know, it seems as though he's maybe intending, maybe uh, foreseeing but not intending, you know. But is that what we're focusing on, or are we focusing on just uh, the suffering inherent in the process? I, is it God's directing of the process that's the problem? The way that I see it, it's just a matter of prediction. So, like, yeah, okay, maybe there are these necessary connections. Uh, maybe. But, I mean, conceivably, epistemically, it definitely could have been otherwise. I mean, maybe they just have some sort of built-in anesthetic such that when they're when the zebra just <laughs> gets the claw from, or whatever, gets, like, the, the teeth from the lion, some sort of built-in anesthetic, like, I don't know, there's some sort of psychophysical law that just kicks in, and they don't feel any suffering, but, you know, the, um, the, the lion can still have its meal and but, so on. But, but here, here's where my problem comes. I notice I had the qualifier that God does not excessively interfere in the system. Well, these are psychophysical yeah. laws built in from the get-go. No, because then, because normally when an animal experience, any of us, we're yeah. animals, when we experience pain, it motivates us to act in an extremely aggressive way to promote our own survival. So what if in some circumstances when an animal is attacked, that immense amount of pain is what allows it to escape the attack and then to go on living? And so then you'd say, well, maybe there's a psychosocial law where the animal doesn't feel pain when there is no possibility for escape. It's like, but there's no real biological mechanism. Right. It would seem like God would end up having God is an do omnipotent it. being. Well, but, but that's what I think. Yeah, he but would, then he'd be interfering. That's my point. Is he could have set it up differently from the get-go with different rules. What I'm saying is God creating a natural system will in, inevitably entail um, things that are more or less perfect in, in competition with each other. I worry that the concept of animal um uh, that that the, you know pain for example like god could create animals you know instead of having pain what if we just had a heads up display that told us hand is burning move hand well, a lot of us would ignore the he the heads up display and you know our hand would become useless you know so this seems to be i wor what i worry the parallel here 
would be like, well, why can't God make people that are free but don't do evil? We qualify humans so much they're not really human or free anymore. Why God can't God make animals that don't suffer in a natural ecosystem? It gets changed and qualified so much they're not really animals. They're more like furry robots that God's like sending around. That's my concern. Well, I just, to me, it seems almost like a limitation of I mean, imagination. I mean, we just, I mean, this is an epistemic argument, so I don't need to say that these are actually metaphysical possibilities. But so long as I can, there's, you know, so long as they're epistemically open, so long as I can conceive of these various other ways that reality could have been, it, we can factor that into our Bayesian analysis. And it just, it really seems as though God could have set up psychophysical laws that really are really finely, highly finely tuned in this sort of way, where they're, uh, I mean, God has infallible foreknowledge of the various ways that things are going to go on. Surely he could have this precisely fine-tuned psychophysical laws that connect the suffering states that the well, organisms are in and their physical states, where it is actually well, privy to whether sure. or not they're going to survive and so on. And, yeah. okay, even if that makes them different than the animals that we do in fact have, my point then would just be why not create, uh, rather, I won't put this as a question because questions aren't arguments, <laughs> My point is, it's more surprising that God created mm -hmm. animals, as we see them, rather than animal star, like the ones that we are describing in this other epistemically possible scenario. That would be more expected under theism, the animal's star, than we see animals. Would you be... I'm curious if your eyes will roll or your response would be to a defense saying, how do we know animal star doesn't exist right now? Yeah. Because yeah. it's very difficult to determine the inner lives of anything, much yes. less animals. That is true. That's true. And yeah. there is some, and I, I like risk being taken the wrong way here yeah. when I explain this. But there are like when you've seen, I, I've seen videos of like animals being like ripped apart, like on Reddit and stuff, and just randomly, yeah, yeah, like a nature channel, and. It's some, like it's actually very strange. Like sometimes you'll look at the animal and they look peaceful, like they're being ripped apart and they're just like sitting there like this, just like getting their <laughs> leg like ripped off. And it's weird. Like so, we, I, I don't I don't know how. Other times though, they definitely don't look peaceful. I, I so. think yeah 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You can find yeah, videos yeah. on the dodgier parts of the internet of human beings doing exactly the same yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean it is it is, but it is a good point that we have to consider now the philosophy of mind and how do we have access to the mental states of, of others and so on. I mean, it's a potentially problematic aspect that God doesn't clue us into this fact, that things suspiciously seem as though it's animals, not animal star. Um, that might present problems of its own. So a different approach to this whole Bayesian like argument from evil is, what about uh, skeptical theism? I, I feel like we should at least discuss like skeptical yeah. theism. I mean, I, I, I'm not like the biggest fan of skeptical theism. I mean, I guess it depends on the day, but it's like one of the most popular responses to the problem of evil is like we really don't know what that probability is of how likely you know the suffering in the world will be given theism yeah. we just don't know what that probability is given the fact that god's knowledge is so much greater than our own and there's you know we we have these epistemic limitations on us mm -hmm. and so forth so what are y'all's thoughts on skeptical theism and how it relates to like bayesian arguments for evil i think it's interesting it's it's we need to be careful because it can turn into universal acid potentially as you've pointed, well, not in, respect, in response to skeptical theism, but universal acid that you've talked about. Like, if we're so epistemically in the dark about God's reasons for action and so on, like, what's going to happen to the rest of natural theology? You know, in order to run certain fine-tuning arguments, you need to be able to make predictions about what God would do or might might do, and you need to make and these And I'm just going to uh, name drop again, John DePoe, yeah. his, uh, his positive skeptical theism is compatible with natural theology. Can We're I, using can a lot I, of big terms. Suggest, I, for, I for, the like, sake of, for the sake of people listening, can we just spell yes. out what skeptical theism actually is? Yes. Because we've said it a few times. Yeah, there are different versions. I'll of, let you do it. Yeah, there are different versions of skeptical theism. Um, the most basic version is the one that your grandma gave. Uh, God's ways are mysterious, basically. Um, his ways are not our ways, so we shouldn't expect to be able to see all the reasons for which God acts. There are much more sophisticated ways, like, oh, the range of possible goods, evils, connections between obtaining states of affairs and so on, of which we are aware, is not representative of the total range of goods, evils, connections between goods and evils and so on that there are, such that we wouldn't be able to conclude from our inability. Or we don't know if our sample is representative. Yeah, whether, whether our sample is representative, such yeah. that we can't justifiably conclude from our, let's say, not being able to see a good coming about from an evil, that there in fact is no such good, or that probably there is no such good. Because the range of goods and evils and necessary connections among them and so on 
that we are aware of is that's not representative of the total range that there is. So we wouldn't be justified in making that leap. So that, uh, yeah, there are different ways to put it. And so more or less we have an idea that, uh, you know, there, there is some reason or justification for the existence of suffering, but even if there is such a reason or explanation, we shouldn't expect to be able to see it. It doesn't follow that we must be able to know what yeah. that reason is or to be able to comprehend that, that reason. Um, this, this seems to, to me a, a good understanding of what, of what skeptical theism is. And what's difficult is that once you make that epistemic distance between us and God so large, um, you start to be able to, you tend to bleed into areas where you're not able to predict what God would do. I mean, will, will God suspend the laws of nature tomorrow? I mean, does he have a sufficiently, maybe he has a morally sufficient reason to do that. I mean, he, after all, God's ways are infinitely greater than our ways. I mean, who are we? The range of reasons of which we're aware is not representative of the range of reasons that there are, and so on. As you pointed out, there are ways to... There's different versions yeah. of, of skeptical theism. I think theism. that might be a bit, like, I'm potentially the biggest problem for skeptical theism is that of a, a kind of moral paralysis that it might bring about. That is, if if there is this suffering that exists, there are kind of deer getting caught under a fallen tree and starving to death and, you know, starvation and predation and this kind of stuff. And we, we don't know what this reason is, but, but there is some reason that it's, that it's, that it's there. There is, there is some good that it's serving. There is something about it that's, that's justified. We run into a problem when it comes to trying to uh, confront it or trying to change it. If we were given us, if we were in a situation where we have the opportunity to prevent an animal from suffering, if skeptical theism is telling or us a that, or, or indeed even a person, if skeptical theism tells us that, well, when you see some suffering, you should essentially assume that there is some good justification, you just don't know what it is. And when I see, uh, it's, it's more difficult with a person because I think scripture quite like for a Christian, they could say, well, we have revelation to tell us that you should be helping people from, from suffering. And that have a morally sufficient reason, of which you're unaware, yeah. to allow... Divine certain, deception. Yeah, for, to allow for certain... Um, yeah, this is, this is true. But so, so, of course, the, the, the problem that I'm, that I'm getting at is that if, when you are faced with evil, the skeptical theist says, when faced with evil and suffering, assume that there is a justification for why it's happening, you just don't know what it is. Then when I see some form of suffering and I have an opportunity to stop it, step in and prevent it, Skeptical theism seems to say that I should actually refrain from helping the drowning child in the pool or something because, well, there's a justification as to why that's taking place. It's a greater good that it's serving. And by stepping in, if God wanted to allow that, that child to drown, he's got better understanding than I do of the situation. So why should I not allow because, the child? Because uh, given my cognitive limitations and that I don't know, God has a greater good for allowing certain evils. Given my limitations, I cannot rule out the greater good is me being heroic and stopping the evils. Given my limitation and skeptical thing, I could say, you're right, I don't know. There could be a lot of greater goods. There could be ones I do or don't know. But one I seem to be aware of at this moment is the good of me ameliorating suffering. And since I am aware of that good and operating on a previous moral command, then it would follow. So I'm not as concerned about skeptical theism being this kind of acid. I do think that in addressing the problem of evil, uh, people who put forward easy solutions probably haven't thought very hard about the problem. I think it's a multifaceted approach. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, though, Alex, that at most, like if you're weighing like it makes God really implausible, it, it, that's got to be weighed against the reasons for God. Yeah. yeah. It, the, the, and then it gets really difficult, like how we assign mathematical values and... But this, this is why I think, for instance, this is why I think it benefits you to, to press like an evidential logical distinction because if you say something like, well, what you're presenting is really an evidential problem of evil, not a logical one, then if you present an argument for the existence of God that's logically valid, mm. then you can say, as you said in our debate, that, well, like any amount of evidential mm -hmm. evidence is not enough to overcome a logical argument right. on the other side. I'm sorry. Uh, so, so yeah. So even if you have a, like a logically valid argument and you think it's like a demonstration, you still have to ask, well, what's the plausibility of each of the premises? And that's going to come in a kind of scale, right? And some of them are going to be more plausible than not. Maybe only 60% plausible, and so on. I mean, your justifications for that that's going to vary. So, almost everything is going to come down to an evidential, which I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Trent Ordi's point. But that's um, that's right. Like, that's I don't really think there is. I mean, like, a, I mean, even when you have these sorts of demonstrations, even in mathematics, you have to assess well, yeah. how plausible is this premise. Uh, and at some point, you're just relying on like, intuition and seemings and so on. But setting that aside, I, you did make a good point in response to the moral paralysis, paralysis objection. But 
that actually might turn against itself when you come back to the skeptical theist response to the problem of evil. I just want to briefly mention that um, Paul Draper points this out. Um, even in response to these sorts of Bayesian arguments, you could say, yeah, maybe God has a morally sufficient reason. Maybe there are goods of which we're unaware that are necessarily connected with these evil states of affairs. But it's also equally true that there might be goods of, or there might be further evils of which you're unaware that are connected mm -hmm. with these sorts of things. Um, uh, maybe, you know, you can, you can add that, but it seems as though the epistemic reasons of which we're unaware that are like good making features that, or that are goods that might come about from this evil, it seems as though that's kind of canceled out from further bad things that might even come about and just horrendous things of which we are unaware as well. And so once those cancel out, we're just left with the first order reasons. And the first order reasons, uh, even granted seen by the skeptical theist, favor like God not allowing these sorts of things, you know, because we know that this is such well, a bad state of affairs. So it seems to cut both ways. Well, let me get back a little because with your concern, I do feel like though, it's like if we weigh these different arguments evidentially, they're trying to prove different things. And so many of the arguments for God are just showing there's a kind of necessary, sustaining, external, transcendent cause of the universe. And some of them purport to show the moral qualities of God. It would be like saying, you know, two orphans are arguing, they live in a horrible situation in their orphanage. And like if, if, if we had loving parents, we wouldn't have ended up here like, well, there's this, there's this possibility and this or that. And then one of them just says, no, this clearly shows we don't have parents. I'm sure the other orphan would say, well, we clearly have parents. I mean, where did we come from? It, it, you know, now it seems like we're disputing whether they're loving or not. Yeah. So it seems like the concern about suffering, it's really focused in on one particular, either power or love, but not necessarily necessity infinite, immutable. Uh, so one could even have your position, you know, that there is a, 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 like Aristotle's God, an unmoved mover, essentially. Uh, although then I guess the theist strategy to move forward would be, do we have more compelling reasons to think God is good, uh, maybe by definition or necessity, than what presence of, of evils might, might sway us in other yeah, I mean, you can even go further, as Stephen Law does. Um, I made a video on his evil God challenge, where he he's, he imagines a God who is exactly opposite to the kind of God that we met with in traditional theism, and we say we have a, a malicious God, an evil God, who basically seeks to bring about the worst possible outcome. Now, if I said that such a God existed, mm -hmm. you would probably rightly laugh at me, in part because we're clearly not in the worst possible outcome. Like, if there was an evil God, he'd make things far worse for us than, than the way that they are. But of course, this mirrors the way that somebody mm -hmm. who says that there's a good God, um, surely, like, this isn't as good as things could be. He could, he could make things much better for us. And so what people do is they say, you have this problem of evil for a good God. But the, the evil God hypothesis has a problem of good. If there is an evil God, then why are there good things? Why isn't everyone suffering all the time? And you can actually construct equal and opposite theodicies. So you could say that, well, the reason why people are, are able to experience joy and happiness is because it makes it worse for the people who are not experiencing joy and happiness. They, they experience different, a deeper level and different kind of suffering, such as the suffering of loneliness, that cannot exist unless there are other people who are existing happily. And so if, if somebody, and, and, and Stephen Law's point is to say that because when you face with the evil God hypothesis, most people say, that is just patently ridiculous because of the world we find ourselves in and, and how suffused with goods it is, that we should be fair in granting the alternative hypothesis that when someone says there's a good God, we should just be saying that's patently absurd because <laughs> of the amount of suffering. My quick rejoinder to the evil God objection is that it only succeeds, this will get us down, and unfortunately we don't have another few hours to talk, I wish. Uh, I'm sure Joe has a lot of thoughts on this. It will turn <laughs> on one's metaphysical understanding of the concepts of good and evil. That if good and evil are just competing substances that only differ trivially, like good is the red stuff and evil is the blue stuff, yes. whatever, then the evil God objection might work. But if one had more of a privation view of evil, that good is more like metal and evil is more like rust, then the concept of an evil God well, God who's completely evil would not be this, you know, nefarious being. It would just be non-existent. And, of course, th th I understand that there are controversial views about the privation theory of evil. But I think in a classical theistic model, 
that's a route that I would go in answering the objection and moving But forward. then isn't there a problem here? Because you said a moment ago that, well, I present a problem of evil, and you say, well, you know, this, this doesn't remove the, the possibility of there being some kind of, of, of God who's just like amoral or something. But it, it seems mm -hmm. to me that, that your own view about the nature of God and the nature of good yes. commits you to saying that that actually isn't a viable option because you can't think of a... You, you well, can't well, think well of yeah, a but I think my view of the nature of God is superior to those that are incorrect. I don't know if that's arrogant to say or not. But, but, but doesn't this mean that, that for, the, for what you just said a moment ago, that somebody could have a problem of evil and just say, at best, this just shows that there's, you know, a, a, a not maximally moral God. That on or, your own account, or they're work, agnostic right? about the deity's character. But and and we we were talking about this in in the context of having arguments for God's existence, and then you've got the problem of suffering, mm -hmm. and you say, well, you've got the arguments for God's existence and the problem of suffering. So the problem of suffering maybe makes you think that God isn't good, but you still got the arguments which show you that God is there. But the kind of arguments that you give, the mm -hmm. kind of arguments that you support. Mm -hmm do seek to establish that God is good by right. nature. And so you, you wouldn't be able to, to make that line as a, as a theist. You wouldn't be able to say, well, yeah, you've got the problem of suffering, but you know, you're, not, you're not ruling out God, you're just ruling out a good God. You, you surely can't do that. Of, co well, of course not, but I don't think the existence of my, the route that I arrive, I agree the ra that with law in that we cannot use empirical observation to determine whether God is essentially good or evil. I think that's a prior metaphysical question I was based gonna, on your understanding of God. I was going to say that the response to the evil God hypothesis that I find plausible is that you just you don't rule out an evil God by looking at good in the world. Yeah. That's that's one of the premises of his argument. And so I just don't think that that's like the way to do it. You've yeah. got to do it other ways. Hmm. I, I would quite like to slightly change course and, and go back to something that we were talking about earlier, which is this idea of if you have goods that are kind of parasitic on evils, would we rather have no evil and no parasitic good? Mm. Or would we rather have them both? I gave the example of Martin Luther King, and, and you said that you'd rather have the world in which there's racism to require a Martin Luther King for the sake of having a Martin Luther King. I quite almost trivially think that it would be preferable to have no racism and no need uh, for a Martin Luther King. Because what it seems to me you're saying, if you say something like that you'd rather the former world, is saying something like we can be glad of the existence of cancer because without the existence of cancer we wouldn't have the good of people coming to uh, develop chemotherapy and, and yeah. cancer research. And cancer research is a good thing. People giving to charity, people doing fundraising, this is a great thing. So isn't it great that we have cancer because it allows this higher order good of cancer research. But clearly we'd rather have no cancer and no need for the cancer research. In the same way I'd rather have no racism and no need for Martin Luther King. I'd rather have no fear and suffering and no need for bravery. Well, I'll, I'll have a quick poetic rejoinder. It's my favorite song. kind. Of course. Um, hmm. I, one of my favorite musicals is uh, Les Mis, based on the novel by Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. And uh, most, many of the characters in there have quite miserable lives based on the, the revolution and poverty and death and very sad, sad scenes in there. But the play is, it's quite beautiful at the end when the main character, uh, Jean Valjean, dies and he is welcomed into to heaven with those. Everyone is, is singing together that, that this has been overcome. It's, it's a one, probably one of the best descriptions of, of the gospel I've ever seen in, in media. And I feel like, would we rather have evil be non-existent or evil be defeated? And I, I think that many people see the importance there. If there, if there is compensation, if we're all brought through, um, rather than just there not being evil, because this gets back to the the question that if the only if the only good we're trying to pursue is just the reduction of suffering, then you know Thanos was fifty percent right. <laughs> you know, um, you'd be amazed how often that specific example is given to me in, in, in these kinds of conversations. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying, and maybe, maybe Joe's right, this comes down to intuitions a, a little bit that we have. But I guess another example might be like, let's say I told you that it turns out this world is a simulation, and you're a program in a computer, and there's all the universe is one guy with a supercomputer. It's like, would you rather have found out that this is a simulation? or that this is real, then you might be grateful that the suffering is gone. But it might also be kind of horrifying to realize all that seemed to be good was not 
not real either. So I don't know if it's as cut and dry. Mm. C.S. Lewis had a had an example of getting me into sorry the Matrix. I, <laughs> I would say no, reality is just different than what we thought it was. Yeah, but, but is it definitely reality? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I agree, but um, is it a preferable kind of reality? Yeah. That would go back to Robert, the philosopher Robert Nozick, yeah, put put forward something called an experience machine. Yeah, that. I, I just I think it's a. I think there are a few things that are a little bit unfair about how Nozick treats the case. For example, he doesn't take into account something like status quo bias. He says, yeah. would you would you jump into an experience machine that brings you nothing but pleasure, but is actually just fake? And there are so many problems. The first is to say. This is different from if you were to wake up and it turns out you have been plugged into the experience machine and the doctors say to you, listen, like your life sucks. Like it, it's, it's really bad. It's even worse than was in the machine. I mean, the simulation. You mean outside the machine. Yeah, like it, it's so much worse out here. But, you know, welcome back. But, but if you like, we'll plug you back in and you'll forget this ever happened. It's at least a lot more plausible that people in that situation would be like, yeah, put me back. Right. So it, so it might have a lot to do with kind of the situation already obtaining, jumping into the experience machine feels different. Also, of course, we have necessarily a kind of omniscience when thinking about the situation. We can talk about being outside of the experience machine, inside the experience machine, what obtains, what the, what the differences are. But to jump into the experience machine requires that you forget that you had the possibility to not do so or to do so. And so when somebody says that in the experience machine this would be a, a worse existence somehow, that intuition just doesn't land with me because once you're in the machine, mm -hmm. it, it's the same thing. You're just living a life and you're just experiencing reality as we experience this reality even here. Even if it's a different, even if it's like a much worse life out there, I mean, I think comparable philosophers, you know, people who go out and actually do these surveys of like folk intuitions and so on, um, yeah, you do get a resounding, um, <laughs> you get a resounding no to get a big experience machine if you're like hopping into it for the first time. Um, but you can actually turn the tables like you were describing and the situation is your whole life so far has been in an experience machine. Now you're faced with a choice to get out. And you know, you're just, I think you're like in, I forget what it is, but you're just like, it's either, it's not worse than your current position, but it's not better. You know, maybe you're just like an artist in uh, Kansas or something, you know, whatever. Yeah, even um, if it, yeah, even yeah, if it's even not if it's worse. Even the same, a lot of people, they actually found like a lot of people wouldn't get out of it. Um, and it's like, it's like really, I forget the specific results, but I think it's like, I, I actually forget, but it's a much more saying uh, you'd stay. Because it's like the people that I know, like you guys, <laughs> you know, like I'd be in a different. But but then have but then have they really reflected on it? Like using phrases like the people I know. Yeah, but th this is this is the problem. But this is exactly what people do when they refuse to jump into the experience machine. I feel like what they're thinking is at least partly influenced by kind of I'd be giving up my life, I'd be giving up my friends and my family, I'd be adopting a whole a whole new new system. A whole but, new world. But of course, once you're in there, it just feels. You know, I was I was sometimes asked. Um, my, the, my university was split up into like a bunch of different colleges. There's no like singular campus. And people are always talking about how they all, everybody seems to feel like they made the right choice of college. Everyone thinks that their college is the best college in the world. I, I wasn't such a fan of, of mine. I thought it was like, okay, I thought there were better ones. And my friends once said to me, but like they said, but if you went to a different college, you, you never would have met us and we'd never be friends. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, but I'd have met other friends and I'd, I'd value them just as equally as I value you right now. They thought that was a bit cold, but, but you get the point. Like it seems, it seems like you wouldn't want to say that, right? In that situation, I might think, but if I went to a different college, I wouldn't have met the friends that, that, I, that I had right now. And sure, that, that's kind of bad, but if I were in that college, I'd be saying the same thing well, about those friends. And it's the same thing with the experience one other, one other tack here. Like, let's say, what would we want God, how would we want God to treat us as creatures? Because one way we might say, well, I would like God to give me infinite happiness. That would seem fair if God gave me infinite happiness. If you could somehow numerically quantify happiness and it turned out to be infinite. Uh, well, then by that logic, even if you had an absolutely horrific finite life, if you have infinite happiness in the afterlife, it would still turn out to be infinite happiness based on transfinite arithmetic. Then suppose you might say, well, no, God should just spare me from just like the absolute worst evils. Because I think many people would say they're willing to tolerate some evil, but not others. Uh, but then I worry maybe their intuitions are off um, even in that, given how the entire system is, is, is set up in that regard. So, there's, there's another thing worth considering, which is that 
I, I think a lot of the discussion around theodicy and around the, the problem of evil kind of assumes a consequentialism. This is something that, that a friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. his name's Dan Woolner, he um, brought this to my attention. He said that like, when you say something like, well, God has this good that he wishes to bring about, and so he'll allow all of this evil, as if to say, like, this, this good is somehow better than this evil, like, there's more good brought about by allowing some evil, and that's why God allows it. But it may be that God, for instance, has a duty to bring about certain things, right? If God has some kind of moral duty to bring about free will, let's say, then it's not just that, well, free will is, is much better than the suffering that it entails. Like, even if the suffering is far worse, if you've got a duty to bring about free will, it would still function as a theodicy. If there's some kind of duty to bring about compassion, or to bring about bravery even, then even if, like, a world in which there's no bravery and no fear is much better, consequentially, from a kind of crude utilitarian perspective, that's a better world than one in which there is bravery, but there's also the fear and suffering. If there's something a bit more like deontological about this, that bravery is just something that must be brought about, then we don't need to debate whether that's a better world or a worse world mm -hmm. than where there's no bravery and suffering, because the theodicy doesn't work in saying that the evil is kind of worth the, uh, or the good is worth the suffering on a, on a kind of balance, but that the good requires that any amount of evil would still be allowed to obtain because it's a duty to bring something about. So. It's, it's weird how, how otherwise generally deontological uh, religious thinkers, when, when having this discussion, are perfectly I, happy to just kind of adopt a consequential. I would say it's teleological, not necessarily consequential. Mm -hmm. It aims for a particular kind of end informed by goodness, uh, but it's not strict kind of consequentialism. God treats creatures as having a particular kind of dignity and good to, to share in him that, who is the ultimate goodness itself. I guess, yeah, it, it will come down maybe to, to intuitions about when we say like goodness, you know, there, there seems like there are these different kinds of good if, if we imagine them. And I think you're right. Some of them are conjoined to evils. Is it really better to never have them at all? Uh, that, maybe Joe's right. Maybe that's just a very basic. That's just when it comes to the existence of God. Some people find the principle <clears throat> sufficient reason plausible. Others don't. And I think this might be one of those very. Like to me, it, it does seem, and I try to make an analogy. I know they're not perfect, but like to creating life through evolution or even begetting, having your own children. And it's like, well, I know, I, I, I mean, I could, you could take, actually, this is something I saw. You should look this up. So Matt Dillahunty did a reply to, as people ask me about antinatalism. Why are you bringing up Matt Dillahan? Right. That's, have you, Why are you bringing him? Have you seen, uh, you know when you debated him on the resurrection? Yes. And you mentioned my name as an Why example. Why are you bringing up Alex O'Connor? Like, Why are you bringing up Alex O'Connor? At least from what I saw with your engagement with Alex O'Connor, you do not oh believe a person. What's wrong? What the hell does Alex O'Connor have to do with this? You've mentioned him twice. He was Why so are you up mad. Alex all I asked him was, Matt, are there... Are there beliefs that you disagree with but find to be reasonable? And you were like, no. You were like, he said no. Yeah. He said no. He said there were no beliefs that it that if he he says, well, I'm a reasonable person. That if that if someone disagrees, there must be. I was like, he, he said just as an example, he was like, so for example, Alex O'Connor's veganism. You think he's wrong, but maybe reasonable. And he like, wouldn't do why, it. Why are you bringing? Up wouldn't this wouldn't do it. But sorry, Matt, Matt Dillahunt. So you were Matt did a reply. People asked him about antinatalism. Yeah. The idea, like, well, is it moral to have children, knowing that they could they could suffer, and you bring someone into existence, and they're harmed, and you didn't get their consent, and all the while, watch the video. All the while, I was watching the video. He was saying, well. There are harms, but there's also these goods that come into play when you bring a child into existence. And we balance that, and I was like, this sounds like a theist responding to the problem of evil. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just found that. So sometimes I like to bring up these other examples to say, oh, well, if it can make sense in one context, albeit it's analogical and there's limits, perhaps it can make sense in, in yeah. another. There are some incredible uh, similarities between the discussion about ch bringing children into existence and God bringing us human beings into existence. And it's even kind of a, a useful analogy in the way it's, you're talking about like a father and his children. Right, it's, and so that's it, why there's I, so many similarities. Right, in the and ethical. so I think that if you're partial say, oh, I could see that there's a benefit here, even though there's costs that are involved, I would push that towards, oh, maybe it could at least be more sensible yeah. God would create. And that he has more resources than 
human and parents this, to this, this is sometimes informed by the fact that people who kind of on balance uh, there are a lot of people who've lived a life that on balance has had more suffering than pleasure maybe it's like 60 40 or something mm -hmm. and yet at the end of their life will think it was worth having and there are also ways that pleasures and pains kind of balance out in in uh, in asymmetrical ways, for instance, I mean, David Benazir talks a lot about this in, in, in of course, in, in Better Never To Have Been. For instance, a life that begins with a lot of suffering but then gets better over time mm -hmm. versus a life that begins with a lot of pleasure and gets worse over time. These yeah. don't seem to be equal. It can't just be like a crude balancing of pleasures and pains. There seems to be something about the the worth of living through this experience that I, needs to be taken. I would love to ask Benatar if, let's say, Christian theism were true. Let's just hedge our bets with Christian universalism. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes to heaven. I wonder if that would change his thesis. It surely has to. You would think. Yeah, no, must do. Must do. It has to. Well, yeah. why don't we uh, send him an email and see if he <laughs> Go right ahead. Thinks. Oh, well, maybe I'll do then. And uh, I'll, I'll, you can I'll, ask, if, he, if he responds, I'll, I'll put, yeah, him, put so something on the screen. You can say theism, then you might qualify universalism. Every, everyone yeah, goes yeah. to heaven. Yeah, yeah well, and, let, yeah, let's ask him. Let's and then, I don't know, this would be an interesting route to a explore also for more more discussions on on problem of evil I don't know. well this has been quite a quite the round table um, I think we've covered a lot of ground uh, and, and had some interesting discussions and I hope that people find this this useful of course it's, it's great to have four people in a room but it also makes it harder to you know hear everybody out on everything but I think we've we struck up a good balance really well. um, I want is there anything like pressing that anybody else is like just dying to get out there before we wrap up <sighs> No, not pressing. I, ha I have other things that I want to talk about, but I think yeah. I may save it for dinner. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, He's everyone. building up his courage. This is, this is the problem of evil now. <laughs> I, I think that um, we can at least all agree that the problem of evil is a, is a very important topic. And yeah. It, it makes sure. it makes a lot of intuitive sense and is something that's that's really worth considering. I mean, my my kind of final analysis of of the situation is that it, it's often framed. The problem of evil is often seen as like the best response to theism. It's like you have this religion, and in response you get the problem of evil. Why are people suffering? Why are people nihilists? Why is life so apparently meaningless? But to me, I feel like this is actually the wrong way around. I, I feel like the best treatment of the nihilistic condition is not found in David Benatar, it's not found in, in like modern atheistic writers, it's found in Ecclesiastes, right? It's found in, it's found in Job, it's found in the Psalms. And it's, it says to me that maybe it's not that the problem of suffering is like a response to religion, but rather religion itself was a response to the and problem that, of suffering. Maybe, maybe that's the thing I, I would close with. Like for me, more of an intuitive end to this is there's also one practical reply to this. It's that if you get rid of God, you still have evil you still have just pure awfulness like i do wonder at what i would do if i were put to the test like if my family died in an accident i i went through job's trial you know i, I had cancer i was just brought to my lowest how you know how would i how would i respond to that and so I, well uh, my friend jimmy aiken for example i love what he says on problem people because he he's dealt with personal tragedy his wife died of an illness shortly after they were married he never remarried and the way he looked at it is, well, you know, Christ Christianity is my my one hope to be reunited with my wife and for evil to be conquered. It, it's the one hope for evil to, to be answered, for there to be a solution. Why would I give that up without there being a good argument against? So I guess for me, like with evil, I am just so thrilled at the prospect of Christianity answering it. I refuse to give up Christianity unless there is another independent reason to show that it's false, mm. I guess. Yeah, I mean, of course I can sympathize with that. I guess I would just say, I mean, I, I equally would, would love it to be true, and mm -hmm. if I believed it, would, would never want to, to give it up. But um, as I say, I think that, that may indeed be why mm -hmm. these religious ideas exist in the first place, rather than being the other way around. But that, maybe that's something we can discuss mm. tomorrow because, of course, we're here in Houston to, sure. to do the event that I mentioned earlier, which, as I say, will be in the past. So I'm sure that a lot of these threads will probably be continued at some point tomorrow. So I'll make sure that everything's linked down in the description. Um, but yeah, this has, been, this has been edifying. So thank you all for Thank for, you. For yeah, thanks for having us on your channel. This, this has been great. Um, for everybody watching, uh, a quick reminder that everything I do is supported by you on patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. A special thanks as always to my top tier patrons for keeping the channel afloat. 
Um, we've, I really do appreciate the, the, the help that you've been given, not just to be able to produce content, but also to be able to justify traveling around the world and speaking to interesting people. So thanks to you in particular. Uh, I've been Alex O'Connor, as always. I've been joined by Cameron Batuzzi, Joe Schmidt, and Trent Horn, and you've been watching the Cosmic Skeptic podcast. Yay. Sweet. Yay. Okay, now we need to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>